in which you start thinking about like what would happen. What you know, I mean, this is this is just the old chestnut. You know, what would happen if we're just like our entire universe is just one atom in a larger universe? Or you know, it's, it's, a, it's a staple of science fiction. You know that there might be some incredibly small scale and creatures living on this incredibly microscopic scale, basically as part of an atom. Uh, Horton hears a who, for example. It turns out that scale is not a symmetry of the universe. There is a very definite scale uh, related to the, the laws of physics. Um, for one thing, if you go to very, very small scales, unlike on what we normally consider macroscopic scales, quantum mechanics, uncertainty, dominates. Well, uh, whereas on human scales, we like to think of things as deterministic, more or less in the mold that, Einstein, that, that Newton described for us. I mean, there's a, there's a fun description. Galileo, one of the things that makes Galileo just more amazing and amazing and amazing, just was once you read more about him, is that he wasn't one of these stodgy scientists who was like, you know, I'm only going to deal with the deepest problems. Galileo was more than willing to, like, pick up some ridiculous proposition and just explore it to its logical extremes. And so, for example, Galileo was a very rational guy. He said, you know, people talk about giants all the time. They talk about them in the Bible. Later on, you know, you, you'd read things like uh, Gulliver's Travels and the post-dated uh, Galileo, but the same basic idea. He said, you know, could there be something like giants? And giants, by the way, when I say giants, I mean creatures that looked and uh, anatomically were structured just like us, but were ten times larger in every dimension. And Galileo said, no, no, this doesn't work. And here's why, and here's why this isn't a scale of the universe, if I, a, a, a um, symmetry of the universe. If I take a normal human and I make them ten times taller, and ten times broader, and ten times wider, that's a thousand times larger, a thousand times more massive, and if they're standing on the earth, a thousand times heavier. But now here's the problem. Their bones. Their bones become a thousand times wider and a thousand times deeper, I suppose, which means they present a hundred times the cross-sectional area. They become, and, and that's what measures the strength. Their bones become a hundred times stronger, but they weigh a thousand times as much. In other words, take a giant, take a normal human, pump them up by a factor of ten, and they'll crumple under their own weight. This is why, by the way, um, uh, Spider-Man, not not uh, scientifically valid. Take a spider, scan them up to human scale, that design does not work anymore. They just squash themselves. Um, he goes on about an oak, 200 cubits high, and so on. Uh, the, the best is, is how he finishes this discussion, however. Thus a small dog could probably carry on his back two or three dogs of his own size, but I believe that a horse could not carry even one of his own size. He, he sketches most things, by the way. I really wish he had sketched this one. So there's, there's some things in the universe that matter, there's some things in the universe that don't, and we've already seen that the law of gravity comes very simply out of uh, an assumption about the, the, the symmetries of the universe, the inverse square law of gravity. There are also some symmetries that are not obvious. So <clears throat> another staple of science fiction, of course, and also science fact, is the idea of antimatter. So antimatter, if you've only, only encountered it in science fiction, you know it's deadly, right? You, you meet your antimatter twin, you go, you shake their hand, and what happens? Boom, right? Complete annihilation. And that's, by the way, reasonably accurate. If there were anti-people wandering around, and you shook them at their hands, you would both be completely obliterated. Now, of course, it wouldn't come to that because the air is made of ordinary matter, and if they were made of antimatter, they'd, they'd be destroyed long before they reached you, which is another way of saying that everything here on Earth, and indeed in our galaxy, and indeed every galaxy that we've ever seen, seems to be made of ordinary matter. But that said, antimatter is not that different than ordinary matter. What is antimatter? Antimatter is nothing more then for every type of particle, there's an antimatter type. There's a particle called an electron, and then there's an antimatter version, which is called a positron. They have the same mass. They have the same what's called spin. And then they just have the opposite charge. An electron has a negative charge, and a positron has a positive charge. There's protons. 
ordinary protons that make up your most of your atoms. And antiprotons, same masses, opposite charges. By the way, there are things called antineutrons. You might think, well, how can that be? It's because neutrons and protons are made up of something more fundamental called quarks, and then antineutrons and antiprotons are made of antiquarks. Now, we've, built, we've made these things in a lab. We've made antihydrogen. We've made antihelium. We're able to produce these things. They behave, as near as we can tell, perfectly, ordinary, perfectly ordinarily by themselves. In fact, I'll even go further. If we were to, if we were to spontaneously, if, you, if there was magic, I, this is like the worst audience to say, if there was magic. <laughs> but if there was magic, and you came along and were like, come in, and all of the matter in the universe was spontaneously changed to antimatter, and what little antimatter there is was changed to ordinary matter, we wouldn't be able to tell. I'll give you the simplest, I'll give you the simplest um, uh, example possible. So, you may know that we owe our uh, designation that electrons are negatively charged to um, Benjamin Franklin. You know, this is a perfect place to be talking to Benjamin Franklin. Um, he could, he, he of the key and the, the, um, the kite and so forth. Now, it's actually a pretty bad designation because when we run a current through a wire, what's happening is electrons are traveling. And the way we describe the flow of current, we say, a flow of current is the direction that positive charge would flow, but since electrons do the flowing, the electrons go that way, so we say the current goes that way. It's a terrible designation. But what if we just decided to switch it? What if we said, okay, bing, electrons change to positrons, protons change to antiprotons, and so on. Well, let's think about the simplest thing we know about how electric charge works. Electric charge works in such a way that opposite charges repel, and, uh, let's try that again. That opposite charges attract and like charges repel. I take two electrons, they repel one another. Magic fairy comes along, changes, remember all, this is the important part, all of the charges, particles to antiparticles and vice versa. Bring, now we've got two positrons, still like charges, still repel. We don't need to change our laws of physics at all. Everything still behaves the same. I had an electron and a positron, change it around, bring, now it's a positron and an electron, they still attract. This would be true, by the way, no matter how we explore these things, everything about electricity, about gravity, about nuclear force, strong nuclear force. There's only the subtlest difference between matter and antimatter, and in describing it, it's not gonna seem like it matters at all. That is, that there is a particle called a neutrino. And, I mean, neutrinos are important, they're very important in the universe. They're created, there's huge numbers of them. The only particle that is more abundant in the universe than neutrinos are photons, the particles of light. But that said, we normally don't experience neutrinos. They can travel through something like a light years worth of lead without ever interacting with anything, just passing straight through it. In order to detect them at all, we need these under, giant underground uh, uh, swimming pools full of like cleaning fluid, and even then we only could detect a few of them a day, even though there are trillions passing through every second. So neutrinos are very, very tough to detect, but that said, they have all sorts of properties, and one of the properties they have is this thing called spin, almost all particles. The only particle we've ever discovered that doesn't have spin is, is the newly discovered Higgs. So if I'd given this talk a couple years ago, I could say every particle we've ever discovered has spin. So, particles have spin, and what does that mean? Uh, we don't want to get too much into detail, but the idea is it's very much like a spinning top. Now, I, there are some, some straight-up physicists in the audience, and you'll forgive me for sort of glossing over some of the details of quantum mechanical spin, but, but think of them very much like you would a top or something like that. The strangest thing is that whenever a neutrino is created, it is always created so that if you take your thumb and point at the direction that it's flying out, and take your fingers to sort of indicate which direction it's spinning, it will always go the way that is, the way that is described by your left hand only. And anti-neutrinos, by your right hand. That's it. That is the difference. That is the observational difference between the two of them. Electro uh, neutrinos are left-handed, anti-neutrinos are right-handed. That's the difference between matter and antimatter. 
Now this is pretty surprising. And by the way, it's, it's surprising, and it also suggests that matter and antimatter obviously can't be a perfect symmetry of the universe because the laws clearly have to incorporate that fact. But we can get rid of that almost completely by looking at it in a mirror. Right? I can take, you take your left hand, you look at it in a mirror, the dude waving back at you is right-handed, and vice versa. So if we do the combination of what's called C, which is to say charge conjugation, that's the magic of switching all of the matter and antimatter, and P, parity, that's looking at it in a mirror, do that combination, that seems to more or less be an almost perfect symmetry of the universe. In other words, there seems to be almost no difference between matter and antimatter. Now, there clearly is. At some point in the universe, matter won. So, how? Well, it turns out, it turns out, uh, there are a few experiments that we can directly do that suggest that even this combination of charge and, and parity is not a perfect symmetry of the universe. Very few experiments, but a few of them. But it turns out that every experiment that we've ever done will, uh, it will give us laws of physics that behave the same if I do three things. And we're going to explore these in a sec, because this this, the third one's going to be weird. Take all of our charges, particles, and turn them into antiparticles and vice versa. Look at the whole thing in the mirror and run the clock of the universe backwards. So there's a very famous, there's a very famous um, idea, and it, this goes back to John Archibald Wheeler at least, and um, you know, who's a Nobel laureate, and, and his student Richard Feynman, who was, I mean, I, I hesitate to say just a Nobel laureate, we sort of think of, of, of Richard Feynman as like a super laureate, like one of the best. And the basic idea was, couldn't we think of positrons, that is to say antimatter, as electrons going backwards in time? Which sounds absurd until you think back to what I just told you a few minutes ago about what, uh, what Benjamin Franklin you know, gave us with regards to current. Benjamin Franklin basically said, oh yeah, if we look at the direction of current, the direction of current is opposite the flow of, of electrons. So imagine doing the following two things. I take my electrons, I turn them all to positrons, and then I take a movie of them and run them in reverse. I get exactly the same current as I started with, right? Because the flow would be going in the exact opposite direction as originally. Hmm. Now this is very strange. But as near as we can tell, as I said, every single interaction, every law of physics we have ever come up with seems to behave exactly the same if we take all our particles, turn them into antiparticles, look at it in a mirror, reverse the flow of time. No problem. Except that it is. I mean, you will, you will humor me to say that there's no fundamental difference between an electron and a positron. And it's clearly more than just a curiosity that we are made of matter and not antimatter. Although, I mean, the fact, that we're, we, the fact that what we are made of we call matter and not antimatter is due to our own prejudices, right? We got to name it. We're certainly not going to name it antimatter. But, and looking at things in a mirror, things do look very reasonable in a mirror, right? Like if you've ever, you've ever in those, I'm not going to say fancy restaurants, let's say mid level restaurants, you know, where the full window or full mirror on the wall and you see some handsome person in the next room <laughs> and they're fooled. Well, I mean, it, it's because it looks reasonable. But now, imagine that third part, the arrow of time. What I'm saying here is that the laws of physics, you know, the, the, there's, there's just as big a difference between looking at something in a mirror as there is running the entire clock of the universe backwards in time. And that's the clock of the universe, like the Big Bang. I mean, at any given interaction. You guys know how my talk begins. You do not know how it ends. The future is very clearly different from the past, and yet, from what we know about the, the basic laws of physics, the arrow of time seems kind of arbitrary. I mean, let me, let me give you a simple example. On the microscopic level, by the way, it is. I mean, here's, a very, here's an actual simulation. I, I ran it on a little computer. I took two electrons and I scattered them off of one another. They deflect one another. Opposite charges, uh, like charges repel. There you go. 
Imagine you took a movie of it. You took a movie of it, ran forward, it would look, this is like on the left. Now imagine you had you know, a VCR or one of these DVRs or something, you know, one of these high-tech things, and you watched the movie in reverse. You, you get what you see in the right panel there. A perfectly valid looking interaction. Or I could take a ball and throw it to you and it would make a parabolic arc. If you, you know, if we watched the movie of that in reverse, it would make a parabolic arc. Now the part where we catch it and throw it would look very strange, but other than that it would look pretty reasonable. So why is it then that the future is different than the past? The answer that physics has, and this is not a complete answer, I gotta tell you, but the answer that physics has has to do with what's known as the second law of thermodynamics, the increase in entropy. Entropy is sort of roughly disorder in the universe. And so you can think of it in this way. Here's, here's sort of the very uh, standard cartoon of this. Imagine you had a partition with a bunch of atoms on one side or the other. Uh, I happen, I had my, my artist draw 10 of them here. And we numbered them, one to 10. They're not actually numbered in this diagram. And I said, uh, imagine the, the most extreme case where 100% of the atoms were in the right-hand partition. Well, it's, it's a bit like if I flipped a coin, it would be exactly like flipping heads 10 times in a row. It's, it's very unlikely, one, problem, one part in a thousand. It is far more likely that if I assigned each of my atoms a partition by, you know, heads goes to the right and tails goes to the left, that they'd be, as in the right-hand case, more or less evenly distributed. And so the idea is, because the even distribution is far more statistically likely than the uneven distribution, over time, we're going to go from low entropy to high entropy. We're going to have you know, gases to diffuse, for example. Now, I can, I can point out a couple of things here. First of all, this is entirely probabilistic. We've got a huge number of atoms in this room, which means that it is absolutely physically possible that at some moment, all of the atoms on this side migrate over to there, we all suffocate, you guys, you guys will be fine, I mean, twice air pressure, twice normal, you could, you could handle. But, but we all suffocate. By sheerest chance, entropy decreases. But of course, once you're dealing with as many atoms as we have in a room, many times Avogadro's number, we're talking about so many atoms and so many coin flips that something ha would have to be at work, practically speaking, to make this happen in anything less than many, 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 many times the age of the universe. In other words, we treat the second law of thermodynamics as a law, but it's really the second outstandingly good idea strongly suggested by thermodynamics. Now, it is worth noting that in one sense, we say, okay, what differentiates the future from the past? Nothing about the overall microscopic laws of the universe, but this macroscopic law says there's an arrow of time given by increase in entropy. Now, entropy and, and information, knowledge for that matter, are intimately related to one another. And there's sort of this classic experiment that James, uh, James Clerk Maxwell came up with in the, the 19th century. He said, look, you know, we know about this thing called thermodynamics. What if we imagined I mean, he didn't think of it as a Cylon, but you know, if, you have an artist, if you have an artist doing your bidding, I mean, how can you resist? And he said, look, what's, you know, what's a class, you know, this is during the Industrial Revolution, we're starting to think seriously about how heat, can, heat and energy can be used to power machines, to do work, and he said, look, you know, you, the best thing we could do is if we had, if we started off with uniform temperature gas, if I can make the hot side hot and the cold side cold and not have to put any work in, I can power a piston, I can do whatever I want. And he says, look, here's, here's my thought experiment. Imagine I had a very clever, he called it a demon. We were going to call it a robot. And imagine if we open up the box, if we open up a little partition between two boxes when a hot atom, that is to say a, a fast moving one, comes in from the right, where a cold one comes in from the left. If you do this, you know, the, the, if you oil your, your little uh, hinge so that it takes no work at all to open it, then you've done no work and yet you've created a hot side and a cold side. And then you can do whatever you want with it. You know that once you do that, power piston, whatever. Now, 
I am just out of curiosity, how many of you are professional scientists? Enough. How many of you get crackpot letters from people, you know, who are claiming to overthrow uh, all known science? 